Welcome to the boiler water treatment concept under the edges of chemical process utilities. Now, before we discuss this uh, boiler water treatment, uh, um, you know that uh, we have covered the topic in the previous lecture related to the different type of inhibition, introduction to microfiltration, ultrafiltration, nanofiltration, reverse osmosis, and we discussed uh, about the mechanism of filtration. Now, in continuation with uh, the mechanism of filtration, we will uh, discuss the if various effect of operating parameters which will be continued in this particular segment and then later part we will discuss about the boiler water treatment which are also the integral part of these operating parameters. So, uh, let us have a look about uh, the effect of salt concentration. Now, usually osmotic pressure is uh, a function of uh, the type and concentration of salts or organic uh, uh, contained in feed water. Now, as salt concentration increases, so does uh, osmotic pressure. So, you can see over here. Now, the amount of uh, feed water driving pressure necessary to reverse the natural direction of osmotic flow. Therefore, largely determined by the level of salt in the feed water. Now, this particular figure demonstrates that if feed pressure uh, remain constant, the higher salt concentration results in lower membrane water flux. So, the increasing uh, osmotic pressure offsets the feed water driving pressure. Now, there is an increase in salt passage through the membrane or we can say the decrease in rejection as the water flux declines. Now, let us have discussed about the effect of pH. The pH tolerance of various types of reverse osmosis membrane can vary widely. Uh, thin film composites membranes, they are the typically stable over a broader pH range than cellulosic acetate membranes or CA membranes. Therefore, they offer the greater operating latitude. You can see or it can be visualized over here. The membrane salt rejection performance, it depends on pH. Water flux may also be affected. So, uh, the water flux and salt rejection of for thin film membranes are essentially stable over a broad pH range. The stability of uh, TF membrane over a broad pH range permits a stronger, faster and more effective cleaning procedure to be used compared to cellulosic acetate membrane. Uh, membrane salt rejection performance usually depends on pH. Water, may, uh, water flux may also be affected. The Water flux and salt rejection for thin film membranes are essentially stable over a broad range of pH. Now, as uh, the start of this uh, particular uh, lecture, we were discussing about uh, the title of this particular lecture that is called the boiler water treatment. Now, see, previously we had a discussion about uh, the quality feed water requirement for the boiler because there may be certain impurities attributed to the vegetation, debris, hardness, etc. This may create the problem of the proper operation of boiler. Scales may form within the tubes of the boiler. This may ultimately corrode the, the tubes and ultimately the pressure build up and the boiler may may explode. Similarly, if scales are usually narrow down um, uh, the inner diameter of uh, the, the tubes, thereby the flow may get fluctuated. So, and moreover, these scales do not have any, any heat value. Therefore, the efficiency of the, the boiler may go down. Therefore, it is an utmost requirement for the boiler feed water treatment because ultimately producing the quality steam, it depends on the properly managed water treatment 
to control the steam purity, deposits and corrosion. So, when we talk about uh, the various scaling parameters, when we talk about the flow fluctuation, when we talk about the, the, the corrosion attributed to the scales and damage to the tubes, so the boiler performance, efficiency and service lives, they are direct products of selecting and controlling feed water used in the boiler. Sometimes uh, the ions, sometimes the dissolved gases, etc., they may produce the scales, foams, etc. And these foams, etc., they do not have any kind of uh, heat value. So, again, the efficiency, performance, etc., they may go down and you may not get the steam as desired. So, therefore, in view of all these, the most of the component in the feed water, they are soluble. Now, under uh, heat and pressure, most of the soluble components come out to the solution as a particulate solid in crystallized form or as amorphous particles. Remember, all these things we have already discussed and see the heat and pressure may alter the concentration of all these soluble components within the boiler feed water. So, when the solubility of a specific component in water is exceeded, the scale or deposits will develop. So, you have to look into this aspect too. The boiler water must be sufficiently free of deposits forming solid to allow and rapid efficient heat transfer and it must not be corrosive to the boiler metal. We have already discussed because all these solids or deposit forming solids may form the scale they may become the corrosive, thereby they, they impact the boiler badly. Now, there are various causes of impurities. The deposits and corrosions results in the efficiency losses. Deposits, they act, may act as uh, insulators and slow down the heat transfer and ultimately the energy efficiency of your boiler may go down, ultimately the performance of your boiler may go down. Large amounts of uh, deposits throughout the boiler, they could reduce the heat transfer to reduce the boiler efficiency and further result in the tube failure. And when this tube failures, this, all, this affects in two ways. One is the efficiency or performance of the boiler may go down and second is boiler may explode to it may create the safety hazard. Now, there are various causes of impurities uh, like uh, hardness salts. The most important chemicals contained in water that influences the formation of deposits in the boiler, they are the salts of calcium and magnesium uh, which are known as the hardness salt. Remember, all these are temperature and pressure depending. So, sometimes if repeated use of water may take place, the concentration of these salts may go up. There are temporary hardnesses. The calcium and magnesium bicarbonate dissolved in water to form an alkaline solution and these salts are known as alkaline hardness. They decompose upon heating, releasing carbon dioxide and forming a soft sludge which settles out. Now, these are called the temporary hardness that can be removed by boiling. Now, there are permanent hardness. The calcium and magnesium sulfates, chlorides, nitrates, etc. when dissolved in water, they are chemically neutral and known as non-alkaline hardness and these are called the permanent hardness to form the hard scale on boiler surfaces which are difficult to remove. Silica, we had a discussion in the previous lectures. The presence of silica in boiler water can rise to the formation of hard silicate scales. It can also associate with calcium and magnesium salt forming calcium and magnesium silicates at very low thermal conductivity. Now, silica can give rise to deposits on steam turbine blades now carried over either in droplets of water in the steam or in volatile form in the steam at high pressure. 
see steam is being produced in the boiler and it is being used as uh, to, to the turbine for the production of electricity or to the movement of various mechanical pumps etc so any kind of a deposition over the steam turbine blades may cause the lower efficiency as well as the wear and tear to all these turbine blades so that's why the silica is again uh, uh, a uh, undesired um, impurity in the boiler feed water. Now other is the iron, either soluble or insoluble. Iron can deposit on boiler parts and tubes and it can damage the downstream equipment and affect the quality of uh, certain manufacturing processes. Now iron may enter the boiler as a result of corrosion in the pre-boiler section or may be redeposited as a result of corrosion in the boiler or condensed state steam. Sometimes iron oxide will be deposited and retard the heat transfer within the boiler tube at a time resulting in tube failure. And sometimes if we neglect the importance of iron, it may become the part and parcel of a steam. And once it becomes the part and parcel of the steam, because it is a very good catalyst, uh, catalytic agent, it may create a problem if a steam is being used as a direct heating media in different chemical reaction. So when we, we were talking about uh, the iron oxide deposition, this usually occur in high heat transfer areas. Screening tubes uh, is the nearest to the flame. Now, when iron is not present uh, in the raw feed water or its presence in the boiler indicates active corrosion uh, within the boiler system itself. Rust, the reddish form of fully ox uh, oxidized, more often in a boiler with a limited oxygen, it is in reduced or black form as magnetite Fe3O4. Now this magnetite, it can be readily detected with magnet. Now it is passivated form of corrosion and its presence shows that proper control of the system is being maintained. Uh, other part uh, of impurity is copper. Now it can cause deposits to settle in high pressure turbines, decreasing their efficiency sometimes requiring costly cleaning or equipment change outs. So the copper is introduced into a system by corrosion of copper piping and copper alloy. And sometimes when we are repeatedly using the steam with respect to the condensate water recovery system, so the copper may become the part and parcel of the condensate waste, condensate water system. So it need to be addressed because otherwise it may create a problem. Again, the copper is a very good catalytic agent. So if we have it, the, the contamination of copper is not addressed properly, then again, if the direct steam is being used in any kind of chemical reaction, then definitely it may create a problem it may cause the, the formation of uh, undesired product, it may form the, the formation of certain byproduct, even it may create a problem of a thermal runaway reaction. Now in boiler, the source of corrosion could be either dissolved gases in the boiler water or excessive use of hydrogen, which can corrode the copper and copper alloy, allowing copper to be carried back to the boiler. So sometimes these hydrogen or certain chemicals are being used to clean the, the tube system, to clean the steam network system. Now this creates sometimes create a problem because the, the inner coating may get destroyed and the, the surface or metallic surface of the tube can be exposed and repeatedly the copper particles or other metal particles may become the part and parcel of the steam and that may create a problem. Now silica we are talking about if it is not removed uh, to a uh, low level especially in high pressure boiler this can uh, cause the high hard scaling. Calcium it can cause uh, the scaling 
in several form depending on the chemistry of the boiler feed water, maybe the calcium silicate, calcium phosphate, etc. Magnesium, if uh, combined with the phosphate magnesium, it can stick to the interior of the boiler and coat tubes, attracting more solids and contributing to scale. Aluminium, again, this uh, uh, deposits uh, as scale on the boiler interior and uh, it can react with the silica to increase the likelihood of uh, scaling. Hardness also causes uh, the deposits and scale on the boiler part and piping. So, it is not necessary that uh, 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 this, these hardness causing an adverse effect to the boiler but it may deposit at the steam distribution network, it may deposit in the piping network, it may deposit in the various valves, it may get deposited in the various parts where steam are being used. So, it has to be addressed properly. Now, dissolved gases, the chemical reactions due to the presence of dissolved gases such as oxygen, carbon dioxide, it can cause severe corrosion on boiler pipes and parts. Now, other impurities, they are oil. Now, the, to prevent oil from entering condensate and feed water system, this certain safety equipments, they are generally being incorporated to detect, remove and arrest such kind of contamination. Uh, the question may arise is that how these oil can enter into the steam network or in the piping network or, or steam generation aspect. This may occur either through the mechanical failure of any equipment like faulty oil deflectors at turbine glands, passing lubricant oil to gland seals, condensers and mean condensers and undetected leaks at tank heating coils, etc. So, there may be a variety of uh, ways through which they, these oil can get contaminated to the, the steam network. Uh, any oil film on internal heating surface is extremely dangerous, drastically impairing heat transfer. Oil film therefore may cause overheating of uh, tube metal, resulting in the possible tube blistering and failure. Now, if uh, oil contamination is suspected, immediate action must be taken for its removal. The first corrective measure is the cleaning up oil leakage is to find and stop the point of oil ingress into the system. Apart from this, this oil may create a problem if again uh, the steam is used as a direct uh, um, uh, in the direct chemical reaction, then it may create a problem. So, by using the degreaser, a cleaning solution can be circulated throughout the boiler system to remove the existing oil contamination. Now, let us discuss about the water treatment type. Like in the previous slides, we had discussed about the various kind of negative effect and uh, may incorporate if uh, the various kind of contaminants are there. Then question arises, we have discussed about the various kind of contaminants, but how we can treat it? How we can remove these contaminants? Because if we have not treated this water well, now remember in boiler, there are two type of system, direct nascent feed water which after, uh, after treatment it can go directly and second is the condensate water recovery system because again the condensate carries a, a precious value or economic value. So, you cannot let it go. So, the treatment protocol calls a very strong intervention and it invites the proper care. So, there are two major type of boiler water treatment. One is the internal water treatment. And second is the external water treatment, maybe by the softening, demineralization, etc. We will discuss one by one. Now, internal water treatment, the internal treatment is carried out by adding certain chemicals to boiler to prevent the formation of scale by converting the scale forming compounds to free flowing sludges, which can be removed by 
blow down. So it can get deposited and uh, intermittently this can be uh, uh, blow it down. Now different waters they require different chemicals sodium carbonate, sodium aluminate, sodium phosphate, sodium sulphite and compounds of vegetable and inorganic origins they are all used for this kind of purpose. Now there are certain external water treatment. Now external water treatment is used to remove the suspended solids which the water may contain, dissolved solids, particularly the calcium and magnesium ion which are major cause of scale formation, dissolved gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide, we have already discussed their, their effect to the boiler feed water. So the external treatment processes whatever available for this boiler feed water, they are ion exchangers, demineralization, reverse osmosis, deaeration. So remember whenever we adopt any protocol for this external water treatment, one thing is very important and that is the economics. We will discuss this thing in due course of time. Now before any of these are used, it is necessary to remove the suspended solids by screening color from the raw water because these may fall the resin used in the subsequent treatment uh, section. So all these things may get deposited over the resin surface and uh, the efficiency of these resins may come down. Now the method of pretreatment includes a simple sedimentation in the settling tank or settling in the clarifier with the aids of uh, coagulation and flocculants sometimes is screening. Another um, thing is that the pressure sand filters with spray aeration to remove carbon dioxide and iron, these may be used to remove the metal salts from the bore well water. The first stage of treatment is to remove hardness salt and possibly non-hardness salt. Next is softening, that is removal of only hardness salt is called softening demineralization, the total removal of salts from solution is called the demineralization. Now let us discuss uh, briefly about the ion exchange process. Now in ion exchange process, uh, the hardness is removed as the water passes through the bed of uh, natural zeolite or synthetic resin and without the formation of uh, any precipitate. So it may be like column structure, you are having this bed and water may go like this or, and you may get the, the pure water. The simplest type is the base exchange in which calcium and magnesium ions are exchanged for sodium ions. Now after saturation, usually the regeneration is carried out with the help of sodium chloride. Now to maintain the economics, the regeneration aspect is again very important. So it is uh, understood that these uh, ion exchangers must have a stipulated regeneration cycles. So the sodium salts being soluble, they do not form a scale in the boilers. Now since base exchangers only replaces the calcium and magnesium with sodium, it does not reduce the TDS content and the blow down quantity. So it also does not reduce the alkalinity. So they are very specific in nature. Now this is the softening reaction Na2R R is the reason CaHCO3 hold twice equal to CAR and twice NaHCO3. Now the regeneration reaction, this is reacted with NaCl to give Na2R, it can be utilized over here and CaCl2. The demineralization, demineralization is complete removal of all salts. This is uh, achieved by using a cation resin which exchanges the cation in a raw water with hydrogen ions producing hydrochloric, sulfuric and carbonic acid. Now carbonic acid uh, which uh, we can remove in, uh, 
and degassing tower in which air is blown through the acid water like this from here the air is blown and remaining we can collect it from here. Now following this uh, the water passes uh, through an anion exchange resin uh, which exchanges uh, anions with the mineral acid and uh, sometimes sulfuric acid and it forms the water. Regeneration of cation and anion is necessary at intervals using mineral acid and caustic soda because all the active sites of these cation and anions may get blocked during the course of water treatment. So, it is necessary that uh, to maintain, uh, to, to, in order to maintain the efficiency, you need to regenerate these sites. The complete removal of silica can be achieved by the correct choice of anion resin. Now, ion exchange processes, uh, it can be used for almost total demineralization if required as uh, is the case of large electric power plant boilers because it is a mandatory requirement. Now, in order to uh, <coughs> remove the dissolved gases or to overcome the problem of uh, the dissolved gases, deaeration is carried out. Now, these dissolved gases may be like oxygen, carbon dioxide, they are usually removed by preheating the pre uh, feed water before it enters to the boiler system. All natural water contains the dissolved gases in solution. It is practically impossible to have the natural water without these dissolved gases. Certain gases such as carbon dioxide, oxygen, greatly increase the corrosion as well as they may impart the, the problem of foaming. Now, when heated in boiler system, the carbon dioxide, CO2 and oxygen, they are released in gases and combined with water to form the carbonic acid, H2CO3. Removal of oxygen, carbon dioxide and other non-condensable gases from boiler feed water is extremely important for the boiler equipment longevity as well as the safety of operation. Carbonic acid corrodes metal reducing the life of equipment and the piping and thereby the metal may get exposed and it can become the part and parcel of the steam. It also dissolves iron which return to the boiler precipitates and causes a scaling on the boiler and tubes. Now, this scale not only contributes to reducing the life of the equipment, but also increases the amount of energy needed to achieve the heat transfer. So, deaeration can be done by mechanical deaerators, by chemical deaeration process, or in combination of these two. There are different type of deaeration, like uh, mechanical deaeration, that is uh, the removal of oxygen and carbon dioxide can be accomplished by heating the boiler feed water. Now, they operate uh, um, at boiling point of water at the pressure in uh, the deaerator. They can be of vacuum pressure type, vacuum type or a pressure type. The vacuum type of deaerator operates below atmospheric pressure at uh, around 82 degrees Celsius and can reduce the oxygen content in water to less than 0 0.02 milligram per liter. The chemical deaeration, the most efficient uh, mechanical deaerator reduces the oxygen to a very low level. Even trace amount of oxygen may cause corrosion damage to a system. Therefore, sometimes the chemical deaeration is also applied. So, to, in order to remove the traces of oxygen and this uh, is being carried out with the help of chemical scavengers such as sodium sulphide or hydrogen. Now, sodium sulphide, this reacts with oxygen to form sodium sulphate which increases the TDS in the boiler water and therefore increases the blow down requirement and make up water quality. Hydrogen reacts with the oxygen to form the nitrogen and water. Now, sometimes reverse osmosis is also being used. 
Uh, we had discussed the concept of reverse osmosis and nanofiltration in the previous lectures. They are often used to down the line in the boiler feed water treatment system. So, most harmful impurities that can fall, clog the reverse osmosis or nanofiltration membranes have been removed. Now, similar processes of separation, they both force pressurized water through the semi permeable membrane, tapping uh, the contaminants such as bacteria, salt, organic, silica, hardness, while allowing the concentrates concentrated purified water through. Not always required in a boiler feed water treatment because these are the costly affairs. These filtration units are used mostly with the high pressure boiler when concentration of suspended and dissolved solid needs to be extremely low. So, in this particular uh, lecture, we had discussed about uh, the various uh, contamination in the boiler feed water. And there are certain methodologies through which we can purify these boiler feed water. Now, in case if you wish to have a further reading, we have enlisted several references in this particular slide. Thank you very much.